Good morning. I'm glad you guys are here today. Uh, there is a, a, an idea of justice that we all have. And we have our court system, and we understand, at least from watching popular TV, the idea of the court and the judge who stands up there. And it is the hope, generically, the hope that this judge is going to be a just judge. And they're uh, going to allow the trial to proceed fairly and justly. Uh, in the case of jury trials, it is this judge's job to basically referee the opposing sides to make sure all the facts are presented fairly, so on and so forth. In cases without a jury trial, it is the judge's job to weigh the evidence and ideally come to a just decision. The problem is that we live in a fallen world, and so as we live in this fallen world, even these judges with the best intentions sometimes get it wrong. I think we're agreed on that much. And so when we uh, look at what is justice, what does a just judge look like? There's good news. We have the picture of the perfect just judge. His name is Yahweh Elohim. That is the Lord God. And so today we're going to see the Lord give Abraham just a glimpse of what a just judge looks like. We're going to pick up some other fun stuff on the way too. What we really want to understand is, will the Lord destroy the righteous along with the wicked? Or another way of asking that is, is it just for the Lord to destroy the righteous along with the wicked? And so as we continue in Genesis, we're going to be in chapter, the second half of chapter 18. I really will read the whole scripture today. Sorry, I missed it last week. Let's remember that Moses is the writer of Genesis. He's uh, received this revelation probably on Mount Sinai when he was in the Lord's presence. And the purpose of this revelation, among other things, is for the Israelites to know where they came from, to remind them of their faithful God and his covenant with them and their forefathers is to encourage them in the Lord. And, and so we, we are looking at Abraham, first Abram, who was called to step out in faith. And he does so, and then they go to Egypt, and then they learn some lessons, and then they come back, and then he worships the Lord. And we've seen Abram's faith over and over and over again being put on display. And we have seen uh, the Lord enter into this covenant and continuously uphold his side, even at times despite Abraham. And if this doesn't resonate with us, I don't know what does. Is that even despite ourselves, we see that the Lord is faithful to continue in fulfilling his covenant. And so last week we talked about how God expects us to believe his promises, even though they're going to happen in supernatural ways. We're to believe him. And so today, uh, and that is because nothing is impossible for God. And so today we're going to take kind of a weird offshoot uh, and look at <clears throat> who is this God that we are to believe, who is uh, that nothing is impossible for. And so I know I keep saying this, the purpose of this series sermons is to have a better idea of what it looks like to have that intimate, deep, abiding relationship with the Lord. And so we're looking at Abraham, who is the man of faith, as Hebrews tells us. We want to continue to look at this as we learn about what our walk may look like as we emulate Abraham, and as we learn about the character of our God, and who is the Lord. And so if you would turn with me to Genesis 18, we're going to start in verse 16. It's my intention to read this in two sections. If I get to point two and I have not read the two sections, it's for my note takers only, it's in your outline. Just raise one hand and I will make sure I go back and read the whole second section. <clears throat> Genesis eighteen sixteen. When the men got up to leave, they looked out over Sodom. Now Abraham was walking with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Should I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? After all, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on the earth will pronounce blessings on one another using his name. I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. 
Then the Lord will give to Abraham what he promised. So the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so blatant that I must go down and see if they are as wicked as the outcry suggests. If not, I want to know. And so as we look at this brief section holistically, one of the first things I want to draw our attention to is that God is revealing his plan to Abraham. It's that God reveals his plans to the righteous. God reveals his plans to the righteous. And so as you recall, last time we saw these three visitors appear to Abraham's tent, and he offers them this great hospitality, and we talked about how that is an indication of God seeking him out, inviting him into intimate fellowship. While they were there, Abraham makes this grand meal for, for the Lord and his two companions, probably angels, uh, and then they make a pronouncement. Sarah is going to have a son. Uh, we've already heard about this a little bit. We saw that pronouncement, and then God gave Abraham the seal of the covenant, that is circumcision, and Abraham responded in faithful obedience, and now we see, saw the Lord reappeared, brought two guys with him, and they have this meal, and this fellowship goes on, and then they pro bounce that Sarah's going to have a baby, and then the Lord leaves. And so now we are at their exit, so to speak. They have set their face to Sodom, and they're going to continue on their journey. And so Abraham was walking with these men on their way. Hold that thought. Let me back up. I also want to point this out. We've been talking for chapters about this son, this seed. Where's the son? Where's the son? Where's the son? And then all of a sudden, God in his wisdom throws this 16 or 17 verses in. We're not going to hear anything about a son in these whole 18 verses, 17 verses, whatever it is. So hold that thought also. Okay, so Abraham is going along with the Lord and his the other two men who were with him. Um, there's a lot of inks put on the page about why Abraham's with them and what's going on and waxing eloquently and I'm not really sure it's that significance significant. Of course, he is wanting to continue this time of fellowship. You all are very familiar with the long goodbye. Same kind of concept. And so while they're walking along, uh, verse 17, we see, begins the Lord's soliloquy, uh, which is just a, a device that is used uh, in narrative so the reader may understand the thoughts of whoever it is that's thinking them, in this case, the Lord. And so the Lord says, should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And the grammar here reflects something that is imminent. It's like God is saying, well, I'm about to go do this thing. Should I tell Abraham about it? And now, we might rightly understand this question as, shall I take Abraham into my confidence? And of course, we can understand just by the evidence so far in Genesis, the answer is going to be yes. Clearly, Abraham is chosen. He has been invited into this special relationship with the Lord. And so this again illustrates the unique relationship that Abraham has with God. That God, for whatever reason, chose him and Abram continued to show faithfulness. Faithful obedience has been our buzzword. And so God chooses to reveal his plan to Abraham. And he gives two reasons. In verse 18, First, we see that, well, after all, he'll become a powerful great nation on earth. All the peoples of the earth are going to pronounce blessings on one another using his name. So recall that this is the same blessing that we saw in chapter 12, 2 and 3. It's almost as if God is saying, I'm going to continue to keep Abraham in my confidence because I chose Abraham to be in my confidence. I find that interesting. So... God has chosen Abraham, he's going to bless him, and as a part of, uh, as a response to this blessing, he's going to continue to keep him in his confidence. Just as an aside, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you also have this same invitation to an intimate relationship with God. So Matthew Henry says this this way. Abraham must know, for he is a friend and a favorite, and one that God has a particular kindness for, 
and great things in store for it. Abraham is to become a great nation, and not only so, but through him, the Messiah, who is from his loins. All nations of the earth shall be blessed. And note the secret of the Lord with those that fear him. That is Psalm 25. Those who by faith live a life of communion with God cannot but know more of his mind than other people, though not with a prophetical, yet with a prudential, practical knowledge. They have better insight than others into what is present and a better foresight of what is to come, at least so much as suffices for their guidance and for their comfort. It's very old English because it was written in the 1800s. Uh, or, sorry, 1700s, 18th century. But I'm pretty sure what he's getting at is this idea that uh, Abraham needs to know this information because God has chosen him and has special things in store for him. Even the Messiah is going to come from his lineage. So true it is true, even modernly, that those who have this intimate communion with God know more of God's mind than other people even other believers who do not endeavor to have this intimate, deep, abiding relationship with him. And so at the least, what we can say is that this is for the benefit of the believer, their guidance and their comfort. And we see what is certainly a reciprocal nature in this relationship between Abraham and God. We see this intimate fellowship, this deep, abiding relationship we see that Abraham has is a result of a reciprocal relationship. Now, certainly God moves first. Don't misunderstand this. God always moves first. As is true with love, always takes the initiative. God is love, and as such, God always goes first. This is shown throughout the Bible, just off the top of my head. Abraham, Moses, David, Paul. I don't know. There's more. I'm sure there is. Um, and modernly, there were a through the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is that Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead. It is in response to this gospel that we enter into this relationship, right? God came first, then we responded by faith in Christ. And so certainly it is a response of faithful obedience that signals to God our desire for this intimacy with him. I am speaking specifically to you. Notice I didn't look at anybody. I don't want anybody throwing anything at me. I could look in the mirror and say the same thing. I am speaking specifically to you. You see, it is our response of faithful obedience to God that signals to him our desire for this intimacy, this deep abiding relationship that he has called us into. We talked a little bit about this idea of as we looked at Romans in Sunday school, if, if you tell God no, God's going to go, okay. If you tell God yes, God is also going to say, okay, let's do this. Let's go. I got you. Ciao. The second reason that Abraham was chosen uh, to, was so that he could command his children to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is verse 19, I do believe. He invites the Lord, invites Abraham into confidence so that Abraham can attest to the righteousness and justice of God and instill in his offspring the fact that this is the way that we are to live. As we move towards relevance to us, I want to be clear about what I am saying as much as what I am not. You see, we cannot say that God always reveals all of his plan to every righteous person. Indeed, much of the time, as we're trudging through the muck and mire of life, we're scratching our head going, man, I sure could use a word from God right now. Indeed, much of the time, it's more of a mystery than revelation, it seems. And yet we hold this idea, which is at odds with other scriptures, such as Amos, uh, which is the prophet speaking on Yahweh's behalf to the prophets, to the other prophets. He's saying that surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. To Abraham and to his prophetic successors, the inside knowledge of divine operation is revealed. And yet, 
this is a tension with what we know practically from life experience. There's been bajillions of times when I've sat down and been like, man, I sure wish I knew what God was doing in my life, whatever thing. Um, great example, I was getting out of the Marine Corps. I was sure that I was going to be a Marine forever. I put up my package to re-enlist. They sat on and sat on and sat on and sat on and sat on it, and 10 months later they said no. Okay, God, I sure wish I knew what you were doing in my life. Turns out the joke's on me. I was supposed to be a pastor. <laughs> so just from practical experience, right, we understand this idea that revelation is according to God's will. It's at his pleasure, uh, both here to Abraham, even as what has been revealed through the prophets, such as those referred to in Amos, and elsewhere, even in God's word. In our day-to-day -day lives, as we ask God, okay, what am I supposed to do about this? Should I buy this car? Should I buy this truck? Or should I fix my broken truck? All of these uh, are things that we come to God wanting his revelation about, and yet we see that it is always at his pleasure, according to his purpose. He doesn't always give us the specific answer, should you buy that truck or not? I don't know, he's probably kind of indifferent to it, to be honest. Go forth and glorify me, son. That's, that's what God has to say. And so as we continue uh, in our own intimate, deep, abiding relationship with him, it is, it is understanding that he reveals what he chooses to. He has indeed revealed what he has said. Uh, and so here we see that Abraham is a favorite, chosen because he was chosen in many ways, and there's this reciprocal relationship. Likewise, the prophets have been chosen because they've been chosen. Again, this reciprocal relationship. They hear the word of the God and they proclaim it like they're supposed to. Um, and so much of God's specific plan for the ages has been revealed to us. And yet, not all of it has. I don't want to beat that horse to death. But all of that said, we need to turn the page. <laughs> oh, boy. So all of that said, we just reiterate that those who live by faith, who live in communion with God, cannot but know more of his mind than other people though not with a prophetical, but with a prudential, practical knowledge. So what's my point? My point is the revelation which we do have is for practical use. And so we see that it is indeed true that the Lord has revealed his plan to the righteous, though not all of his plan to all of the righteous. Okay. Did I miss something important here? I don't think I did. So, what is it that God now shares with Abraham? It is the outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah that has reached heaven. Now, these two verses, I think, are really interesting. There is a whole lot there. I'm just going to point out a few things that I think are important to the big picture of the passage. These two verses uh, use a word play based on the Hebrew words for outcry and righteousness, and they sound similar. And this mnemonic device is used to draw the reader's attention to the outcry, which is evil, and the response from the Lord, which is righteous. So the narrator is using a juxtaposition, this wordplay of these words that sound like each other, the evil outcry and the righteousness of the Lord. And so we must not miss the careful judgment of God. He's going to go for himself to see this evil. Twenty-one. I must go down and see if they are as wicked as the outcry suggests. This is reminiscent of Genesis 11, 1 through 9, the Tower of Babel story, where God must go down and see. Is this as big of a problem as I think it is? And indeed, God goes and sees and confirms the catastrophe and carries out his judgment. Further, in these three verses, or two verses, there is an emphasis on the completeness of the evil in Sodom and Gomorrah. It is, if it was indeed as bad as the cry sounded, the only thing to do is pass just judgment. The idea being, the evil has come to its complete fruition. They can't be any worse than they are. And so, simply put, these two verses are to stress the fact of God's righteous judgment. Indeed, it is this that Abraham is to take special note of. It's the point of God inviting Abraham into this whole 
confidence and sharing all of this with him, I'm going to go do this because these things are happening, is to, for God to illustrate of himself, I'm righteous and I need you to know that I'm righteous. So I'm letting you in on the inside of all of this. It isn't as if God didn't know the truth of the outcry. He didn't need to go out there, for, down there, to see Sodom and Gomorrah for his own benefit. Right? Shockingly, God can't learn. He's already aware of the truth of the matter. See, he's doing this to, to make an illustration because God responds to the intercession of the righteous. Verse 22, one more time, God responds to the intercession of the righteous. We'll pick up in verse 22. The two men turned and headed toward Sodom, but Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham approached and said, will you sweep away the godly with the wicked? What if there are 50 godly people in the city? Will you really wipe it out and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 godly to do such a thing? To kill the godly with the wicked, treating the godly and the wicked alike? Far be it from you! Will not the judge of the whole earth do what is right? And so the Lord replied, If I find in the city of Sodom 50 godly, aka righteous people, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham asked, since I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes, what if there are five less than fifty godly people? Will you destroy the whole city because five are lacking? He replied, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Abraham spoke to him again, what if forty are, fo are found there? He replied, I will not do it for the sake of the forty. Then Abraham said, may the Lord not be angry so that I may speak. What if 30 are found there? He replied, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, since I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 are found there? He replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. Finally, Abraham said, may the Lord not be angry so that I may speak just once more. What if 10 are found there? He replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 10. And the Lord went on his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham. Then Abraham returned home. So this whole situation has now been set up. The two men with the Lord have departed. Abraham remains and stands before the Lord to ask the bold question, will you sweep away the godly along with the wicked? What Abraham is really asking is, are you really the righteous judge? Would you condemn the righteous to be found in this city? Far be it for you to do that. And that's what Abram gets to in verse 25. Abraham gets to in verse 25. Will not the judge of the whole earth do what is right? And so God replies, of course, I will spare the whole city for the sake of 50 righteous people. Now don't miss this. This is the point. That God is going down to see the evil firsthand, and then he will pass judgment. Yet if he finds the 50 righteous people in the city, he will spare it because of them. And so we see this juxtaposition here, the wicked versus the righteous. Now remember that righteous simply means morally correct according to God's standards. We don't yet know what specifically the wicked are doing. We do know that it is the righteous who live by faith. And so remember that we've talked in the past several weeks about the fact that human righteousness is credited to us through faith. And sure, God is saying, if I find 50 people who have faith in me, who worship me, who are therefore called righteous, I will spare the whole city. And so as Abraham continues his plea, he works with the Lord back and forth down to 10 people. If there are 10 righteous people found, the Lord will not destroy the city for their sake. Because God is the just judge. And as such, he will spare the wicked for the sake of the godly for the sake of the righteous. He will respond with favor to the intercession of the righteous on behalf of the righteous. So indeed, as we will see in the next chapter, the only righteous people to be found are Lot and his family. And they are, in fact, rescued from the judgment that follows. And so we see that God is a righteous judge. He is the just judge. He brings the rain on the unrighteous and the righteous alike for the sake of of the righteous. And there's a whole other sermon in here about how God's 
delaying judgment, how God's final judgment allows him to be completely just and completely merciful. So in short, it is because final judgment is delayed that God may spare the wicked for the sake of the righteous for a time. Because, as my beautiful and brilliant fiancé pointed out to me, reminded me again, that God is not willing that any should perish. And so delayed judgment does not mean that God is an unjust God, but rather it means that he is patient and long-suffering and completely consistent within himself. And so he blesses the wicked because he is blessing the righteous. He is waiting for the playing out of the plan that he created from eternity past, that as many as possible may come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ before final judgment falls on them. Meanwhile, he continues to bless and prosper the righteous, and so even those who are the wicked living among the righteous receive the general generic blessings. So, it's kind of an interesting little story. It has nothing to do with our progress of getting to the sun, which is really the point of this section of the Abraham story. We have to remember it's not as if God didn't know the truth about Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not that he didn't know as he went down there he wasn't going to find ten righteous people. Yet, he went down to see for himself to assure Abraham of his, that is the Lord's, righteousness, of his own right standing according to his statutes, which he has established in eternity past. And so it is a demonstration of his righteous judgment to demonstrate that it is the Lord who assesses the truth against the wicked. He doesn't jump to conclusions, but rather he does have all of the information when he passes judgment. And of course, this is an illustration meaning that God didn't need to go down in order to know he can't learn, he knew all along. But he does this for the sake of Abraham, and indeed even the sake of us, these thousands of years later, to understand that our God is a just God, that he is righteous. And for the sake of his offspring, that is Abram's offspring, that God is just and doesn't pass judgment or make decisions willy-nilly or on a whim, but rather, he is, he is the omnipotent God who has all of the information, and yet, in his mercy, is patient and long-suffering that as many as possible will come to saving knowledge. To be clear, this seems to be the point of this whole episode. Abraham needs to learn this important lesson about our righteous judge in order that he may pass it on through the generations. A couple of takeaways, we're almost through. The righteous, that is, believers in, the, in Jesus as Lord and Savior modernly, because we are now in the church age, ought to be interceding on behalf of others for the sake of righteousness and justice. Indeed, the Lord will spare the righteous. Something I didn't talk about a lot because I think it's a tertiary concept. It's the boldness of Abraham to come before the Lord. But as believers in Jesus Christ, who is our intercessor sitting next to the God the Father, we are also given that same right to enter into God's throne room with boldness and petition the Creator to say, Lord, this is not just. What about the righteous in this situation? Or whatever other petitions we have for Him. Also, the righteous themselves ought to promote righteous injustice so as to enjoy God's blessings because we know that God will withhold judgment for the sake of the righteous remnant. I think this takes all sorts of shapes and forms, uh, but tied into all of this, Abraham was invited into this confidence to witness all of these things so that he would teach his offspring that it is proper to do righteousness and behave justly. And so as we promote righteousness and justice, the common good of the land comes with that. And it is because of the righteous remnant that God withholds his wrath and his judgment. This means, among other things, that a nation may be saved for the sake of a faithful remnant. 
like perhaps this nation. And so I try not to use my pulpit as a place to speak politically. So if you think this is political, I apologize, it's not. You see, God's word says that God's people are to promote justice. God's word says that God's righteous people, wherever they find themselves, specifically to Israel when they were in exile, pray for the land. Because when the land prospers, you also prosper. As you all, the church now, are my voice for righteousness, bringing his kingdom here on earth just as it is in heaven. So I say all of these things to bring us to our application for today. We want to continue to pray for the righteous in this nation. We need to continue to pray for the righteous in this nation. We need to continue to pray for God's church here on earth. Every day, we need to be praying. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for the righteousness which you credit to us on account of your son, Jesus. It is for the sake of the righteous remnant. Spare this nation further judgment. But rather, Lord, teach us to love well and stand on your truth, that we may be a part of a revival in this nation, that many more brothers and sisters in Christ would be gained, and that your glory would be shown by the righteous living of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, it is as we promote the general welfare, as we promote righteousness and justice, as we pray and ask God to be merciful to the wicked for the sake of the righteous among us. That is entirely in line with God's word. As Christians, it is our duty to be doing these things with the ultimate goal of more people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It's only in the, the ultimate fruition of Christ coming to earth to rule and reign in his kingdom that absolute complete justice will be the law of the land. Let's pray. Lord our God, we are overwhelmed with your love and your blessings and your goodness for us. Lord, allow us to continue uh, to be sure that you have revealed your plan to us uh, at your pleasure in accordance uh, with, with your desire for us to know what you're doing. Uh, we know that your word includes all of what we need for salvation in Jesus Christ and holy Word. We pray that you would help us continue to stand on those things as we uh, promote justice and righteousness, and as we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, and especially in this nation, that we may have a revival, that we may have a remembrance uh, that it is uh, that it is according to your statutes that we are called to live. Help us to be bold. Help us to love well. Above all, use us, Lord, for your glory and the furthering of your kingdom here on earth. I pray this in Jesus' name.